good morning. I think we're just about right on time here. Welcome to our panel on supply chain and smart contracts. Uh, my name is Doug Morris, and I'm the panel moderator this morning. I hold the Bobby and Coulter R. Sublet Centennial Professorship of Business. I'm a professor in supply chain management and a senior fellow at, in the uh, University of Texas Supply Chain Management Center of Excellence. I've spent uh, 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 the better part of my time here teaching and doing research in the supply chain area. I've also had the privilege of working on projects with companies from several different industries, including oil field services, high tech, retail, healthcare, and construction. Now, I'm not an expert in uh, blockchain. Rather, I consider myself a student on a rapid learning curve, and with good reason. Uh, companies I'm working with, particularly in construction and energy sectors, are asking questions. Also, my students are asking about blockchain. The questions range from curiosity about the new technology to the potential for generating business value to concern or maybe even fear of falling behind and being disrupted or disintermediated. Regardless of what questions you may have, we're glad you're here today. Uh, we hope that the, the uh, opening keynote in this panel uh, will add to your understanding of this emerging technology uh, in the supply chain space. Now, it's my great pleasure to introduce our distinguished uh, panelists. I will start uh, by introducing uh, Mr. Jason Kelly, General Manager, IBM. Mr. Kelly leads IBM Global Blockchain Services, partnering with client organizations and consortia to unleash the exponential business value of blockchain technologies and reinvented business processes. His teams provide the thought leadership and consultative capabilities needed to design, develop, and rapidly adopt digital ledgers, digital identity, trust, and transparency with IBM blockchain offerings and solutions. Prior to this role, Mr. Kelly led IBM Global Business Services Solutions, design and innovation, helping clients to transform, differentiate, and lead in the market through digital reinvention, applying IBM design thinking and the application of agile, DevOps, and innovative technology. His teams bring endless energy, creativity, outcomes for IBM clients around the world, delivering unique business capability with the marriage of analytics, automation, robotics, Watson, and cloud technologies. Mr. Kelly also served as IBM CTO and design leader for IBM business process outsourcing and previously managed IBM analytics business in North America, China, and Asia Pacific. He also led initiatives in IBM's software, global technology services, and sales and distribution units across industries. A graduate of the US Military Academy at West Point, Mr. Kelly also earned an MBA from the Cox School of Business at Southern Methodist University with a concentration in technology and entrepreneurship. Mr. Kelly contributes to IBM's ongoing leadership and patents as a holder of three US patents and others pending. Welcome, Jason, this morning. Uh, I'll, uh, I would also like to introduce Mr. Paul Cacuzzo, Executive Director, Supply Chain and External Supply IT at Merck & Company. Mr. Cacuzzo is responsible for enabling Merck's supply chain planning, distribution and logistics, and contract supply organizations to achieve their strategic and transformational goals through the development and execution of IT strategies aimed at improving cost and service. With a balanced focus on mature platform technologies, co-development and collaborations, and the experimentation and adoption of emerging and advanced technologies such as blockchain, IoT, and AI, Mr. Cacuzzo is establishing a digital eco ecosystem that continually evolves, improves, and renews as the business continues its mission of providing innovative products and services that save and improve lives around the world. As the IT leader to Merck's supply chain portfolio of innovation, Mr. Cacuzzo is leading Merck's manufacturing division experimentation with many technologies. He has completed multiple blockchain projects in document management as well as product track and trace in end-to-end -end supply chains. Mr. Cacuzzo brings over 20 years of experience as an IT professional, having worked across multiple industries, including life sciences, healthcare, consumer products, and public sector and business functions including finance, corporate planning, supply chain research and development, and commercial. He has had a leadership role in very large scale change initiatives including Merck's SAP program which was the largest, most comprehensive program in any industry and led entrepreneurial startup initiatives to create new business ventures. Prior to his work at Merck, Mr. Cacuzzo spent time at Accenture and the Interregional Port Authority of New York, New Jersey. Mr. Cacuzzo holds a Bachelor of Science in Industrial and Management Engineering from the Rensselaer Polytechnic Institute. Welcome, Paul. I have asked each of our panelists to begin with an opening statement, after which we will open it up for questions and discussion. I'm going to ask Jason to start us first, and to kick us off for his uh, opening statement, I'm going to uh, bring up a uh, video here.
The following is a demonstration of how IBM and Maersk are partnering to digitize and simplify global trade using blockchain to create trust and transparency in the supply chain. Global trade functions much as it has since the introduction of the shipping container in 1956. Manual paper-based processes are still common and information about the status of goods is locked away in organizational silos. Today, 90% of goods in global trade are carried by the shipping industry, with the supply chain slowed by the complexity and sheer volume of point-to-point -point communication across a loosely coupled web of land transportation providers, freight forwarders, customs brokers, governments, ports and ocean carriers. IBM and Maersk are addressing this problem with a distributed, permission platform accessible by the supply chain ecosystem designed to exchange event data and handle document workflows. Maersk and IBM are employing blockchain technology to create a global, tamper-proof system for digitizing trade workflow and tracking shipments end-to-end, -end, eliminating frictions including costly point-to-point -point communications. The collaboration will launch with the potential ability to track millions of container journeys per year and integrate with customs authorities on selected trade lanes. In a recent test by Maersk, shipping a single container of flowers from Kenya to the port of Rotterdam resulted in a stack of nearly 200 communications. Using this example, we will examine how blockchain has been implemented to create trust and security in the digitized document workflow and improve the efficiency of global supply chains. Here we can see each distinct entity involved in the transaction, the growers, export authorities, ports, customs and importers. Shipping from the port of Mombasa requires signatures from three different agencies approving the export and six documents that describe the origin, chemical treatments, quality of the produce and customs duties. Firstly, using a PC or mobile device, the Kenyan farm submits a packing list that becomes visible to all participants. This action initiates a smart contract that enforces an export approval workflow between the three agencies. As each agency signs, the status is updated for all to see. Simultaneously, information about the inspection of the flowers, the sealing of the refrigerated container, the pickup by the trucker and the approval from customs is communicated to the port of Mombasa, allowing them to prepare for the container. All actions relating to the documents and the physical goods are captured and shared, which documents were submitted, when and by whom, where the flowers are and who is in possession of them and the next steps in their journey. Flowers are perishable so it's crucial that there are no delays or missteps. Blockchain provides secure data exchange and a tamper-proof repository for these documents and shipping events. This system could significantly reduce delays and fraud, saving billions of dollars annually. And according to the WTO, reducing barriers within the international supply chain could increase worldwide GDP by almost 5% and total trade volume by 15%. For more information on how IBM can help make blockchain right for your business, please visit ibm.com slash blockchain. All right, well, thanks uh, for having us here again, Jason Kelly. And the first thing uh, I'd say, I'm, a, I'm uh, always learning. And what I just learned today is that's a pretty damn long slide. <laughs> Sorry. Uh, I, have no idea. I was, I was, I was so few patient you had as you read through and that in the video. We're halfway through already. So there you go. Um, opening comments, I, it's, it's hard to follow anything as uh, following up him and times uh, he covered it for you. He gives he gives a background of what uh, this is supposed to be. When I read this, I avoid saying that 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 was blockchain because it is white shiny object and everyone is running after it. If you then back through my career at IBM, whether it was SOA, Data Analytics, Cognitive, AI, all of these Things that are out there that are bright and shiny, and it, it's it's not the technology. It's about the outcome, as Frank talked about. You know, the outcome going from six to eight, eight to now is going to the second system. That's an outcome. That that's what that's what we want businesses to do. And the consumer out there, that's us. What we buy things on, or what we consume things based on value, on reputation, on on pride, all these. These steps, just as we showed in this video, different events that Frank talked about, from 
farm store, that those steps all have exchanges. We're just talking about an exchange of value and where we see 200 documents to ship something from, from Africa to the Netherlands, it's not just the paper. Each one of those documents has people and process around it. Someone had to file that paper, someone had to touch it, give it into something. So someone had to fax it, and yes, there are still fax machines out there confirming it. So if, if we're able to pull those things out of the system, we're actually just putting value into the system. Value in the, in the way of speed, of certainty, right? Transparency. And in the end, the beneficiary is right here. Us. We benefit. Whether it's a mango or whether it's uh, a, a, a drug that's very valuable to us getting by with heart. So that's what you're getting is an outcome. So in, in this example, 200 documents came down to 20 documents. That's a big deal. And so that's what I want. You know, any message you get out of this big hype cycle is that there are real outcomes happening right now. HTTP IP took three decades to come out to be the internet that we all value. This is 10 years old, and you already see the utilizer. And I, I'm honored to be still amongst our, our IBM clients, which is my partner, ones that are really doing it. So this isn't a science experiment. This isn't, oh, we'll, we'll wait and see. This is happening now. And that's the exciting part. That's why I think that the, the conference is sold out. I mean, this is something that's, that's real. And that's what I, I like to start with and end with. This is something that you and your businesses and your, your, your colleagues should know about because it's happening. It's not just the bright, shiny thing trying to find it. Not not the sandwich looking for it, but actually something that's real that can be turned value. So we start with outcomes. So let's let's think about that when we talk about blockchain. What are the outcomes that we're getting to? And then let's talk about whether blockchain applies to the digital value system. I'll start in with that because it's bright and shiny and it's getting to turn. So with that, I'll pass it. Thank you, Jason. hear me? Okay, very good. Could, could you not hear me? No? I, oh, well, that's wonderful. <laughs> I, thought I, I can hear you great, Jason. Jason. So damn eloquent. That's why you were silent. I mean, and then now it's just like, oh, well, I can't hear what that bald headed guy is saying. There you go. Okay, you guys can hear me. It was fine. meaningful. Just real quickly, um, by a show of hands, how many folks in the audience um, have worked on or worked for companies that have actually put a blockchain solution into a production environment? Okay. I hope you guys brought a lot of business cards because everybody wants to talk to you after this, uh, after this call today. Um, I think that's actually an important aspect because, as Jason just said, it is still bright and shiny. It's still very new. Very few people have gotten all the way to the end. Uh, and I think that becomes part of the mystery. Um, and when you start to think about where everybody is in the journey of blockchain, there are substantially fewer of those than there are people who are still trying to figure out if blockchain is one word. Is it a capital B or a lowercase? Easy to where it's hyphenated. And you have those two ends of the spectrum. And there are probably more people closer to that side than there are to this side with actual production applications. Um, so when I think about what we're doing from a life sciences pharmaceutical company uh, and how we, we think about this technology, it actually stems from the word that I think was just said before and I think Frank said before, which is frictionless. It's our goal to enable frictionless flow of products to the patient. That's our goal. And we think this technology is a key driver to how we get there. If you think about how we've gotten to today, to this moment, the last 30 years, we're filled with hundreds of millions of dollars spent on ERP implementations that did a fantastic job with these beautiful suites of systems to integrate in an, in an enterprise. Sure. Okay. Thank you. No problem. Over? 
new building <laughs> folks. Uh, so we went from this journey of these ERP solutions, which beautifully integrated our enterprise, sales, marketing, logistics, finance, production, procurement, accounting and finance. And we went through this journey over the last 30, 35 years. And during this journey, we then said, well, we need to extend to customers and suppliers. So we did things like EDI and the concept of standards became really important. And then we went through the e-commerce journey. And then what something really important started happening in our industry is we started thinking about, there are some people who make things better than we make things. We started contract manufacturing. We realized that there are better distribution capabilities than we could deliver ourselves. So we started having our distribution uh, capabilities and moved to third parties. And we very slowly disintegrated all this integration work that we've spent time together, which made it really hard. Because the ERP promise was a single version of the truth. And now truth was disparate across all the different entities and organizations. And we struggled to say, how do I get back to a single version of the truth? Because my truth sits with third parties. And oh, by the way, those third parties also make for my peers, and they distribute for my peers. So suddenly, I went from a single version of the truth to many truths that somehow need to be strung together. And we think about blockchain as the thing that essentially brings all of that back together to establish what we would consider the universal truth. Uh, and within that universal truth, we have to start to focus on things like standards. We have to start to focus on how many people collaborate. Is it an entire industry? Is it sectors of an industry? Is it consortiums within an industry? We need to start thinking about how we pull all of that back together. Because on top of that universal truth, our goal is to get to that frictionless flow of product in the industry. Hello? Okay, now it's on. Yes, thank you, gentlemen. Um, so as uh, my prerogative as the panel uh, moderator, I'm gonna ask uh, a, a question. Uh, one of the topics here in this uh, panel is on smart contracts. So from at least my perspective, that seems to be one of the most innovative things about blockchain we spend, and maybe complex in terms of uh, trying to connect this coming to, uh, to fruition. Huh. Over closer? Okay. okay, thank you. Um, so what, uh, what, are, what are the things that need to be in place to make smart contracts viable, and how will they evolve into the future? So um, we're going to come over the blockchain solution for mics. So, um, <clears throat> turn my phone off. Uh, really, yeah, I could not even use the mic. So smart contracts. There are a couple things that the thought of a smart contract and back to that. Back to that. Uh, I dreamt about this one. All right, so can you hear me now? Yeah. All right, so smart contracts. We think of smart contracts. There's two things that, that have always been elusive with, with anything that we're dealing with in business. Think of the transfer of value. And the, what's, what's been missing has been access to data. And then once you get the data, that that data is correct. And so if we can give access to data and make sure that that data is correct, then the transfer of value should be able to happen with some sense of reliability. Trust. That's what a contract is, right? You trust. I trust. Paul and I are going to make an exchange. We shake hands. We, we trust each other. It's done because we both know the data. We both know each other. We know what's going to change. If we can return that trust to the system so that the system has it, that becomes an executable contract without any third party involved, without anybody to verify or validate that, because the system knows that it's correct. 
you know, people say all these, oh, it's, it's, not, uh, it's not real yet. Again, I go back to the well, state, the state of Tennessee, it's, it's real. They, you can make contracts, smart contracts on the blockchain because you can validate it just the same. I mean, how many people really sign their name at that point of sale? Or do you just spit it on that thing? Why do we still do that? Is that smart? So this is my point, is that now we have a system that gives access and transparency, and you, you can really then trust the system, and it brings you network, and you then know that these transactions can happen because of access. Okay. This will be fun. We should move the podium. So, so I, I think, you know, the first most critical component of it is that in many industries, um, you have to deal with some form of record keeping, some form of logistical tracking of transactions and records to understand that these things happen, and these are the parties that are accountable for that thing that happens. Whether it be financial records, whether it be validation records that the regulator may come in and inspect. So one of the initial challenges for smart contracts are going to be simply this. This contract executes without any human being say go, without any human being's digital signature attached to it. But effectively what's happening is the pre-existence of conditions, a transaction has occurred, a transfer of an asset in exchange for money has occurred. The digital signature that that transaction has actually occurred is going to be different. It's going to be based on the simple existence of conditions and therefore it executes. And so the first thing we're going to have to overcome is the idea that in the recording of activity, that you're not necessarily going to have a name associated with it. And so when you think about, for those of you who think about financial transactions, for those of you who think about regulatory transactions, this concept of the computer making decisions to execute things based on an environment and set of constraints is going to be the thing that we have to get in our head now uh, for us to get towards that longer term adoption. Which is why some of the earlier use cases that we're participating in um, really have more to do with the fact that a frictionless flow of activity that can occur within an enterprise or with an extended set of enterprises that don't have some of those same barriers. So from our perspective, that's the initial. Uh, we know we're moving to the next phase. So we're moving to a space where these smart contracts are going to be responsible for executing transactions that um, other people did things that forced this to happen, and we're working through how to actually detail out the recording of that transaction associated back to an individual, because that's what regulations require. Okay. Um, so now we're going to open it up to all of you with questions and, and discussion. So um, I will try to be democratic and diverse and spread this around. I may even cold call on some, you know, especially up there. I'm kidding. I'm not. Uh, so let's go ahead and start back here. Uh, switch back and forth here. Um, so great question. What it, how do you deal with incorrect data being entered into the chain? You don't. You can't. You're still going to have incorrect data put it in. You, if there's a human involved, something's going to go wrong. Um, that's not a problem that it solves. We get to this thing, what does this blockchain solve? No, it doesn't. But once that data is in there, it's in there. And in a permission network, you know who put the data in there. You know the identity. And when you see that it's wrong, there's this thought that, oh, it's immutable. It's no, you can change it. But then you also know who changed it and what they changed it to. That's the goodness. So will you get rid of error? No. Will you, will you magically be able to enter data in? As, as Frank said, no, there will be devices that will, that will do that. What's, what's key, though, is you think of this thought of, not, it's not that you're going to change the data. It's the idea that you know who did it and when. And that's the transparency that we're talking about so that you can identify bad actors, not that they're doing something nefarious. It, it may be a bad actor who did not know. So you can find that error. Also, you start thinking of not just people, 
but now think of entities because when you're shipping mangoes and they're being shipped at a certain temperature, there is a temperature gauge, a thermometer that's in the truck, that's in that container that says that it's in a certain location because of the GPS. So now you have a GPS that has an identity, you have a thermometer that has an identity, you have a truck that has an identity, and a container that has it. You just introduce four additional factors because of the data that you're trying to track. So does that get exciting? Yes, but it also gets pretty damn complicated. And so now you start thinking of one key thing that comes out of it is security. So that visibility does, in fact, drive some additional uh, requirements around understanding how that data got there, who put it there, and people can see, and that's the beauty of it. This actually is one of the hardest parts that we're trying to solve for the Let me first talk about it on a global level. Um, on a global problem basis, not every regulator has achieved the same implementations for the civilization model. Some have actually went against GS1 standards. And therefore, it's very difficult to Right now, globally centralized points Barcode stands are di they're different, the DOD computers are different, what they require is different. If I come back to just the US, we've done a pretty nice job of being with GS1. But not everybody has the same interpretation of the uh, I was just talking to somebody yesterday, we're and maybe 30 plus years in the EDI, and even in 30 plus years in EDI, and got a header, it's got a footer, it's got a bunch of stuff in the middle, but what people choose to put inside there is based on what the customer wants, and the supplier needs. Uh, so it is going to be a very interesting challenge, which is for us why we said, let's start small. Let's look at the way that we can interoperate with others with a minimal data set to, to define what it is that we need to standardize, standardize around that. And we're actually working with GS1 to say, based on that logging that will allow us to do what we're trying to do in an experimental way right now, and over time. So I think it's going to start with really what is the critical elements of the standard, and then what is the extended attributes that we can add to that standard where people can get creative around them. We have to get to what is those things that are critical to actually function and drop it. So it's, it's a great, great question. What's the current status of the regulatory environment around blockchain and the supply chain? And it's it, to say what's the regulatory environment? There's not a new regulatory environment for blockchain. There's not a new blockchain regulatory environment. We're still dealing with the same environment that we have. What now comes up? What is what do we need when we start talking about specific? Requirements, there is the need to think about previous governance. What we don't want to produce is anything that's going to slow it down. I, I, I saw a story with Mr. Ball here earlier where the media I was in London a few weeks back and just went to G20 was meeting and I got a phone call day one. Stop by the G20. Yeah, the G20. Okay, great. So I walk in, a little name tag. And it was very, very uh, funny to hear the thought around regulatory. We had a lot of our, our top nations, most, most developed nations, talking regulatory and compliance. And then the other nations were saying, this is the moment of our market. I'm ready to go fast. They were trying to figure out how to go fast. So I think we, we are going to look at and hear new, new things coming to play. Uh, I 
leave it with a thought that's more exciting. I, I always try and spin it and, and say, listen, it's, it's not spin me, not the message, but turn the table and spin. Because it's not so much the regulatory environment, but now what we're saying with the word regulatory environment, if you care for the regulatory environment, is it an audit anymore? Do they have to audit? Bring them in. Make compliance part of the process so you don't have to have a regulatory environment. You don't have to break out of the sweat when they say, oh, well, regulators come in and go, well, they should be in there anyway because they should be on the team. So think of it differently now. Think of how that's going to change. You don't have to break out of the sweat when you ask regulatory questions because governance is built in by design, by transparency. So let me just add, um, the U.S. Human Health, Human Health Services Organization, which is the parent of the CDC and the FDA, uh, in 2016, actually issued a call for white papers on how blockchain is disrupting U.S. health care. Um, they issued that in the summer of 2016, which means they've probably been thinking about it for longer than the summer of 2016. Uh, since then, both the FDA and the CDC have actually had partnerships this is turning into an IBM sales pitch. Um, but they have both been in this partnership 18 months ago. Both that they're actively pursuing blockchain as opposed to some other problems. Um, and they've announced some pretty big goals. Uh, human health, uh, electronic health records, um, looking at product distribution. So the one specific challenge we're working on in pharmaceutical supply uh, chain is a US regulation we call serialization, which is essentially tracking the product in the supply chain. Um, at the public meeting with the FDA in December, the industry has been trying by themselves for 18 months to figure out how we're going to meet the next milestone of this regulation. And at this public meeting with the FDA, if you come up on the slide, can blockchain solve this problem? So I would say to answer to your question, because there are many examples of this, regulators are substantially further ahead than we are, uh, and so now we have to figure out how do we capitalize on that fact, close that gap, so that we can begin to bring people together to say this is the right way to do it, and that exchange concept and regulators are going to work. Great question. You know, this thought of uh, are we including payments within the supply chain process? And payment part of the process is something that we know is, is essential. We have a payments network that uh, can be integrated into that supply chain effort. You think of the transaction of value, then how do you complete that transaction of value? And it's really payment. And so that's when it starts to hit that path of what type of those, those questions that come up in the businesses and how they want, they want to tokenize and what their tokenization is for that as well. What's more important is thinking about that as a step in the process that we can talk about the handshakes and payment as part of that. And if you can make that easier so that when you're going and you're dropping a shipment off at a retail location that's off in the middle of somewhere in a village and someone doesn't want to exchange cash, but instead have a smart contract that can that exchange. Now, again, we're talking about opening up markets. We're talking about giving opportunity maybe to some stores that couldn't have that opportunity before. So think of this as, as opening up opportunity for you to open up these transactions to new ways to transact. Your business. So that was a purposeful spectrum of regulatory environment. So if we, if, if that data can be entered into the chain, the question is, if you, have we created something then off-chain to, to try and correct 
does that undermine the, the, the system? Well, I think if you do that, it's like all the one ledger account is one ledger. Right. So again, that's one ledger. And then everyone creates their own ledger. We had this with the world of spreadsheets. Got Microsoft and Excel was the greatest thing, and they had their own and their company to come up with their own spreadsheet. <laughs> right? And yes, to so your question, does that help? We have, even within our own system, this cloud of dispute resolution is a huge opportunity on the chain. There's no reason why you can't integrate that into the chain. So dispute resolution can be a, a component of a chain, something that we did ourselves company and I'm also quoting now saying the name saying the name not an IBM information as you say yeah you got it on your chest Jason <laughs> think we're dumb <laughs> we are a convener of opportunity look at it. so this is on when we first tested it ourselves we put it into global finance sent us a point of time we had seven five million dollars in that week sitting in that that, that chain Put that on the chain and just give visibility to the transaction. That's one thing, but if we could use that visibility to have dispute resolution on the chain and understand the visibility what's there, then we're really opening up the opportunity. You don't want it off the chain environment. That would be my advice if, if, if we were working on it. So then being able to integrate that again, it's you now can put all of those things together, and you don't have to create things on the side. Again, speed to transact. I think the, the key is if there's a mistaken transaction, both parties agree it's mistaken, the second entry tracks. Both transactions are there on the chain. It's going to get complicated when you have two parties, one party thinks it's this, one party thinks it doesn't. Then we need to figure out the structures of the transaction, which is a white paper that talks to that. Have a number that tells you what those things are in the documentation. But also remember, creating physical documents is something we've been trying to solve with or without blockchain. Transformation. Um, the, the difference is with blockchain, we're trying to both digitize that document and track down and say what the things that are there. So, in my industry, certificate of analysis is a critical component as it goes through the supply chain, they know it's a physical piece of paper. First step is can I digitize that? And the second step is can I create a document that can track that because I can be sure that it has gotten where it needs to be and I can believe that the document was written and received by the end party so that I know I've got my right to creation. So I think the concept of is the creation of documentation a value driver? It is a value driver, but that's not what we're going to pursue. What we're really going to pursue is kind of this automatic. Like this, we call it like the spaghetti and meatball slide. Every node is the meatball. It's lines with your spaghetti. And that picture resonates to every person in every industry. So we can deal with that. And what blockchain is trying to do is every line that connects every one of those nodes is linked from one pipe to this company, that pipe to that company. And those companies do the same thing. How many pipes do I have to all of my customers, and suppliers, and so forth? How many standards am I dealing with with each of them? The concept of blockchain is the single pipe concept. Blockchains are meaningless. I have one thing down and one thing up. I understand how to interpret what comes up and I understand how to put it down and I can come up. And so what I'm really trying to do is turn that map into something fundamentally different where in concept the lines still exist. 
that's trade, but the flow of documentation, records, and so forth that have to flow with that, but done in a very ubiquitous way with the single pipe concept. So that's the first real thing that we look at and say, that's game changing from a cost of operations. As an IT professional, that's game changing. to uh, drive a, a point about understanding the outcome. I think anytime there's a new technology, you can always say, how are we going to take cost out? And I left a consultant through the door with a briefcase. This consultant with a briefcase. The briefcase of files are all in the next one. So we're not in it. And they're going to tell you, here's how much I'm going to save. How do you know? Maybe the cost of that document is different in upper case than it is in Maybe that's not the problem they're trying to solve. So let's understand the cost basis for the challenge. Maybe they're trying to open up markets with visibility of information. So it's, it's all about asking the right question and understanding the outcome that you're trying to get to and then deciding how you apply it. I jump in anytime I get a question like that. What's better is big animal pictures that then you can place back to your client. When you hear Walmart say, oh, we went from seven days to 2.2 seconds. Okay, now put that back into your, your company and see what happens. You say, MERS goes from 200 documents to 20 documents. Well, put that back into your company and understand what's going on. So be, be aware and be skeptical of cost savings until you understand the fundamental basis for it. Ownership, I love the, the ownership question. This is, always comes up, and no, Walmart does not own the, the nodes. In fact, think of, we, we say this often, you know, blockchain is a team sport. And in that, it's a network. It's a, there are different models of who owns the data. But then you set up a consortium and have a consortium own the data. That's a possible. And you have IBM and Walmart stand up. So there's different ownership models with regards to who owns the network. There's different models with regards to who drives the nodes. But think of those nodes as being part of the permission capability across the network. This is where this trust and transparency comes in. This is the democratization of that capability. So that's the beauty and the strength that you can have when you're able to get those parties working together. It's less about ownership than it is being able to see the data. Let me, just, let me just add to that. So, I mean, there's a core answer to the question, which is if you're participating, the node that you own, that's ownership. You own that infrastructure. Your participation in the rest relies on other nodes to be scheduled up and also connected. And other folks want that. that so that's a, a partial question. But I also don't want to overlook the question. Because one of the things that we see we approach customers as required to work on the project with us is that exact question. Is can we call it today governance, but I want to take it down from governance to some of the very specific things. Who owns who has costs? Who share costs? Who makes the decisions? How do we define that? How do we define intellectual property that gets developed on those kinds of things? And what I want to caution everybody is that I'm sure if you haven't thought of that question, you will think of that question sometime soon. What I would say is don't let that paralyze you from moving forward. You can move forward with your answers to all those questions, recognizing that those need to be answered to your customers. But it's a very insightful and important question because that will happen on your journey.
So let's start with my company will probably produce a 500 million units of drug product into the country. Um, with this new regulation that we have in effect today, you're adding cost because those are going to be used in phases of the scale as they move through the supply chain. Now think about the fact that some pharmacies don't have scanning equipment in their pharmacies. There are literally pharmacies that don't even have that. Some pharmacies don't have enough um, there are some, uh, some distributors who still don't have the mature IT infrastructure and environment to participate in this type of regulation. And so what we believe with pharmacy blockchain is, is let's start that collectively with the hope that that collective solution dramatically reduces cost and eliminates the need for each of us to go off and enhance the systems that we run and hope that the seven or eight software companies that sit in the space will solve it not only solve the problem, but solve interconnectivity amongst themselves. Um, and so I don't think you can connect teams in the regulatory environment that I'm trying to operate with and connect to the blockchain to solve it. I'm trying to take a new distributed ledger that we can share in the cost of implementation because it's going to be massive because we don't do that the infrastructure and the technical capability to deliver something from scratch. Right? So they can take advantage of the collective know-how of the group the collective muscle and strength of big players who will be able to influence technology partners to do this differently and for the benefit of the entire ecosystem. Two separate companies. I, I would have to argue for both clients of, of blockchain both. And this is why I say blockchain is a team sport. We all get excited when there's content. Everybody wants to get someone against someone else. It's an exciting game. It's not that exciting. It's really boring. Blockchain is not that exciting. It's all, when you have Walmart stand on stage and say, and then I called up Kroger. Sorry, but your flight's over, buddy. <laughs> so is Amazon a force? Yes. And God bless them. And we want them to get bigger, better, faster, but it drives the market. Blockchain, and this is why I say it's not, not an IBM commercial, because I have, you can see, I can see the K, KPMG, uh, matter of fact, we're working together with KPMG at Merck, and they're like, oh, that's your enemy. It is not my enemy. Well, Jason, don't you compete with Ethereum? No, oh, it's a public network. I want to you compete with Porta. No, I'm just with David Rudder yesterday. He's talking about how we're going to work together on an insurance thing in Europe next week. Let's not get focused on old. Uh, you talk about legacy? IBM competing with Amazon, Amazon competing with Walmart. That's legacy. That's legacy speak. Let's talk about where we're going. Let's talk about how we're going to make sure that high waters raise all ships. That's why we have this thought of GDP being increased. When you can bring people into the market that don't have access to the market right now because the hurdles are too high, because the trust is too sparse, then let's increase trust, let's increase the market size, and let's encourage the next Amazon that's going to have Amazon staying up at night to enter the market. That's what we're talking about with blockchain, not dealing with legacy models. We're talking about new models.
Yeah, so I, mean, I think we also to be clear, when we say transparency, that doesn't mean um, open visibility, right? So the data that sits in every node of the blockchain is not human readable, right? But it all needs to be there so we understand how we can trust every contributing part. Right? It's cryptographically hashed so that attempts to unhash and make any sense. So from a transparency perspective, the benefit we get is that we know what activity has been involved. So we understand with each new trade partner what inventory balances they have, what financial terms they may be able to meet, and so forth. Um, but I can't look in my node and see all of my competitors' activity to the extent that I can see. Uh, they're pushing 10 million units of a competitive product into the marketplace. What do I need to do to understand that? That's not the that's not the structure. Yeah, so from our specific uh, use cases that we're focused on, we're one node removed, right? We haven't gone double step on that. And actually, even for what we do downstream, we've got distributors, we've got customers, pharmacies, and so forth. So we haven't peeked into that because, again, that's one of their customers. And those that we're working with haven't opened that door that said, let's start off. But we have to engage with them together. Upstream from us, most of those upstream steps are, are internal steps anyway although we do have a growing presence of companies that do production as well. And we haven't started to talk to them. Um, they're on our list. Our portfolio does include our contract manufacturers. But the initial focus is much more on the, the trade side than it is anything else. Um, so for us, we're tackling it as a one node of needle production. We're heading towards patient because the regulators are driving us there right now. Uh, but we do have an idea that says, uh, at some point, this full interoperable network has to include every stakeholder. Back to that picture that I said, which it has to get there, because otherwise the, the overall structure doesn't hang together. The, the challenge is going to be, is it a blockchain singular, or do we have to figure out how to take multiple individual blockchains and tie them together? That's the technology question. Let's uh, thank our panel.